Okay, Eric is in the water. Are we clear to cut her loose? Clear to release. Marcus past the stern. Roger, roger. Atlanta's in the water. Roger that. Hercules, dive, dive, dive.
winch. Winch fan. All stop, four nine meters. Are you ready for control? Star, ready for control. Got it.
Yep, can hear you. Yep. Okay. We can hear you, but you're quite low. SPL. Yeah, that's fine. I can hear you better now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine because I don't think there's any particular objective related to those exact waypoints. So we, I think it will be okay for us to just uh, move. Yeah. I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Sounds great to me. Thank you.
Hi everyone, um, tuning in on our uh, dive today. Thank you so much for coming to explore with us. We're currently descending um, and we're at Gambia Shoal, which is a seamount with a summit at a depth of about 1600 meters and located roughly 25 nautical miles southeast of Midway Atoll. Uh, so this is an area that was mapped for the first time by RV Falcor in 2014, but no previous dives have been collected or have been conducted here uh, previously. So on our dive, we'll be um, exploring this area with our ROV as well as um, getting some biological and geological samples to better understand the marine life and the um, geologic history in this area. So thank you so much for tuning in again. Um, we will be descending for a while. Um, so we will be looking at blue water for a while, but hoping some things pass by. And in the meantime, we'll um, go ahead and introduce ourselves. So my name is Kara. I am the Science Communication Fellow Board on this watch, um, the noon to four watch and midnight to 4 a.m. watch. And uh, my job here is to help share some of our photos, um, share the science with all audiences from young to old. And um, it's been such an amazing journey so far. We've been aboard for uh, uh, over two weeks and we still have uh, a little less than a week and a half to go. So it's um, been really amazing to be a part of this Ala Al Moana Kayuli expedition. And I'll go ahead and pass it off to Hans on my right. Hi, thanks for tuning in. My name is Hans van Tilburg. I'm a maritime archaeologist and historian for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And I am assisting the uh, afternoon watch here as watch lead. And I will be pushing the button <laughs> on the still the cam. Button. <laughs> and learning more about biology <laughs> and geology. <laughs> You know what button I push. <laughs> that's I push that button. Oh, For our viewers, I. that's um, the still cam camera button. Yeah, that <laughs> is a powerful button. Uh, so hi, everybody. I am Upashana Ganguly. I'm from India. And I'm a deep sea biologist studying the wonderful deep sea corals. I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. And I'm having a great time here, learning from everybody. Uh, getting to explore some of the beautiful sea mounts in the middle of Pacific and it's been a great journey so far and looking forward to the remaining part of our expedition and Taylor Ann. Hi, I'm Taylor Ann. I am the data logger on this watch um, and also the science manager. Uh, it's my job to take all observations down and as notes, everything that we see on this dive, all the creatures, um, all the geological features that we see trying to get a good description of this place that we have not seen before. Um, so tag along for this journey. Uh, welcome. I'll pass awesome. it on up to Mia. Hi, everyone. I'm Mia. I'm serving as a navigator on this watch. And when I'm not, uh, when we're not uh, ROVing, I'm working as a seafloor mapper. Um, we're working on descending right now. So the front row is kind of busy. Uh, no more, right to my left, we have he doesn't have a headphone on, so I'll enter. Oh, you want to go? Yeah. So <laughs> Jake is going to log in here to say hello. Thanks, Mia. And um, if you don't mind later, we'll come back to you and get an idea of the terrain we're looking at today. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hello, Akako. Good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Jacob. I am currently sitting in a Herc chair, but I am the Atalanta pilot. Stoked to be here. I know we're still doing some things in the front row, so... Um, uh, oh, okay. Sorry. No I, w <laughs> I have to do all that over again. I wasn't on SPL. I was going to tell Jacob he's uh, no longer Atlanta pilot. He's now a heart pilot sitting Ooh. in the heart chair. <laughs> it counts. Um, I'm. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Dan, and I'm coming to you from the Argus chair today. 
Aloha, my name is Jaina Galvez and I am the video engineer on this watch. Thanks, Jaina, and I'll pass it back uh, back here to Elsie. Thanks, Kara, Ali, and um, good morning, good evening, everybody. My name is Elsie, and I'm from a small Pacific island in the West Pacific called Palau. And I'm here uh, on board the Nautilus as a, on this watch as a supporting scientist. And when not on the Nautilus, I'm a researcher at the Palau International Coral Reef Center. And um, it's been a great 20 days at sea and can't wait to see what the rest of our voyage holds. Awesome. Um, thank you, our wonderful team. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about any of the team members you just heard about, we all have profiles on the NautilusLive.org website. And it's really amazing. We have such a diverse team here from different uh, backgrounds, ages, uh, cultural um, backgrounds as well. And we have a filmmaker, Anna Palau International Coral Reef Center researcher, and a PhD student, and a mega lab member, and an amazing mapper, and um, person who takes free online courses to learn things in their free time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and an artist, and a um, um, a scientific diver with 50 years of experience and Dan the f most famous ROV pilot who always gets shout outs so many shout outs on the comment box I can't even say them all because it would be too too much um, <laughs> so we really have such an amazing team um, and we're uh, glad to share our stories with you on the website web page and if you have any questions uh, feel free to also enter those into the chat box on our page and we'll try to get to them when we can um, we are descending so hopefully everything goes smoothly as we head towards the bottom um, Mia, would you like to give like a little rundown if you're not too busy of kind of what the terrain is looking like? Because uh, I know you were involved in the mapping of um, Gambia Shoal where we're where we're exploring today, right? Yeah, if you give me a few minutes, I'll I'll jump in. Yeah, sure, no problem. Yeah, and as always, um, for our viewers, uh, we want to make sure the ROV operations and navigation mapping are going smoothly before we continue our chat and not interrupt those um, really important uh, operational tasks. So if we ever pause, um, just keep in mind that we're making sure everything is going uh, according to plan. And uh, today we have Atalanta and Hercules on the dive today. Um, Jacob, you already have a shout out? Go Jacob. <laughs> um, And thank you to our viewers who um, indicated that our chart light or our chat box light is currently red. I just um, turned that back on to green. So again, feel free to share your comments, uh, questions, and stories with us. We got a question. Will Jacob get a chance to drive Hercules again today? So Jacob is currently in the Hercules chair right now. So, yeah. <laughs> Go Jacob. About a thousand meters more of descent.
Uh, while we're heading down, um, uh, Upashana or Taylor, Ann, would you like to share a little bit about, you know, what we might be anticipating for sampling today? Are we planning to get some more um, rocks for Val in certain areas, or again, our priority list of uh, biological specimens? Yeah. So we have our um, the same list of priority species that we've um, been keeping a tally of throughout the expedition, um, but we do have a little bit in, of a change in our um, agenda for th the rock collection. So we're gonna uh, pay more attention to collecting rocks at the lower um, first waypoints. It seems like those are turning out to be better samples. Um, so that was some feedback that um, Val had after um, rock o'clock this morning when they were cutting open <laughs> some of the, the yeah. amazing rocks that we've been able to collect and right. see what's inside and help them uh, understand more about the history and origin of the seamount, um, of all the seamounts, sorry, that we've been exploring. So today we'll be kind of adjusting our um, approach with how we collect some of those rocks. So instead of t collecting one just every kilometer, we're going to um, kind of focus on the first lower waypoints. So gotcha. waypoints one through four, I believe, are the lowest or the deepest. Um, but yeah, we can keep that conversation open as we go along. Um, but yeah, if we see any novel species or any organisms that we haven't really studied much, those will be, you know, um, options for collection and it'll be something we'll discuss with the scientists on, on board as well as the scientists ashore. So yeah, that's kind of how things will go today. We'll have a conversation about what our priorities are and how we can best honor the sacred place and only take what we need. Right, yeah, so thank you for that rundown. Always really helpful to know um, like what we're planning to do during the dive. Yeah, no problem. And definitely seeing Val with the like rock saw was so interesting. <laughs> I've never seen that before. She was basically uh, supposedly grapefruit sized rocks, but sometimes a lot larger. <laughs> um, <laughs> It'd be hard to them. estimate, yeah. Yeah, and um, the inside was so like interesting, all these like different, I don't really know that much about geology, but I think she was using terms like vesicles, like little pieces inside. And then um, seeing that manganese crust was so interesting because that accumulates like a few millimeters per year, right? So that was so awesome. Have yeah. you seen really amazing rock samples um, from your time here? Because you've been on multiple expeditions. Yeah, yeah, definitely all different sizes of rocks <laughs> um, with all different types of contents. Um, very, very impressive to see what's inside of these manganese crusts. Uh, wow. A lot more diversity than you would think. Um, yeah. They all look very different. Um, I'm not too sure. I can't really remember what the, the different types of rocks are and what they mean, but <laughs> um, definitely fascinating to look at the different textures and some of them have like crystals forming in them. Wow, yeah. yeah very beautiful specimens. Um, yeah, like yeah. one of them was shiny, like sparkly that we opened. Yeah. And also it's like amazing to me how most of the rocks, like from a very non-geologist point of view, can look very same, similar from the outside. But when you open them up and I've been seeing the cut up rocks in the lab and they look so different and yeah. I'm just amazed at how they can identify these differences by looking at the rocks from the outside and understand look okay, this is what it is and they look so different and then the colors change with layers and it's, yeah. it's amazing. Really cool. And um, how did uh, the sampling uh, processing go previously last night? I think that might have been our fastest sample <laughs> processing in history. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we didn't really have that many uh, biological samples to process. I think we only had two. Um, and then we had a little bit of an issue with some of our Niskins, which, you know, things happen sometimes. So had to troubleshoot those issues. So we only got one Niskin sample yesterday. Um, and then I'm not sure, I think maybe five or six rock samples. So it, yeah, it didn't take us very long to process, you know, especially nice. as a team think a team of like five or six of us go and collect the organisms in the rocks off of the ROV and bring them back into the wet lab and awesome. kind of just yeah have a little task force together to get those <laughs> samples processed and ready to go <laughs> the wet lab task force <laughs> I like it science team go yeah, yeah. science team <laughs> yeah it's Were been you? great learning any more new skills or anything else because I know you've been kind of like learning about all sorts of things in the wet lab 
But she was a professional I was the photographer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also a really important part yeah. of collection. So for uh, the biological samples, you're supposed to take photos of them uh, along with a ruler so that you can see um, how big they are uh, and then just keep that as an um, observation. And then I, I was also taking photos of the scientists who were processing, which um, is not always, I know that, yeah, like for when we're in the field and when we're doing our work, we're not always thinking about taking photos of us doing the work, but it's nice to have that to kind of show that we're out here doing our thing. Yeah, and, um, for sure the human element of yeah. all of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I definitely have sent you so many photos. <laughs> I hope I'm sorry if I've sent you too many yeah. photos of yourself, but and I'm just so proud of you. And just to <laughs> add a little bit to the importance of the pictures that Elsie was taking yesterday, that uh, definitely it's for the record that these were collected and this is general measurements, but another very important part is that anything underwater uh, in situ images of organisms, especially because they are in a completely different environment, and that becomes more important in water sampling or in aquatic environments or marine environments. Organisms look very different. So we have very good in-situ images, got to see these uh, uh, ROVs with excellent camera systems. And then once they are above water, we need to have very good images to understand how they correspond and correlate to the in-situ images. And once our parts, tissues are preserved in ethanol, they also change color and right. formations. Mm -hmm. So uh, for characteristics and for understanding what organism is what, to, for IDing them, for understanding their morphology, it is very important and crucial to have images of each stage. Because for example, I can tell you from my own experience that I have seen corals in situ and I had worked with samples and for, for many of the seabeds, I was like, okay, I didn't know how they looked in situ. Right, yeah. Because there weren't any reference images for in situ images or for when for the, uh, when for the in situ images, they didn't have any reference sample images connected to them because they can look so different that you will not even guess that those, those are the same or Right, kind of. Yeah, yeah. So, so like it's very important and crucial to have images uh, and also because images give us uh, good morphology, can get, tell us a lot about the morphology, the structure of the arrangement of the polyps. I'm just using corals as an example here. Right. Um, arrangement of the polyps, the structure of the polyps, the color. So all these degrade when preserved in ethanol. So good images are never redundant right when it right comes to science, i right? think a famous example of that might be the blobfish yeah. right <laughs> like everyone is like yes. oh my god look at this fish with a nose but like yeah. actually it doesn't look like that yeah, underwater exactly. <laughs> exactly. i'm glad that it got a lot of attention and yeah, a lot of love exactly. for yeah. its blobbiness but, <laughs> but it's not it's it's easier when it comes to terrestrial organisms because uh, they look similar because we are st st still in the same habitat but it changes a lot in uh, when it comes right. to aquatic and very organisms. So and speaking yeah. of terrestrial, I think you know what I'm going to ask you next. <laughs> so for all our viewers who don't know, Upashana, the amazing deep sea coral biologist, <laughs> formerly was a terrestrial conservation biologist. So terrestrial meaning like land. And she was working with like elephants and rhinos, which are a totally different organism than deep sea corals, right? Well, vertebrates. I wasn't working vertebrates. with elephants and rhinos. I was working in a habitat in a forest which had uh, elephants and rhinos. I was more concerned about, I was involved in a, uh, human tiger conflict project. Human, so it was yeah. more of a tiger conservation project in a habitat which had rhinos. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, I got too excited. Mostly no, no, focused no, no, no. on yeah. tigers, um, but still. <laughs> um, so in one of our other dives, um, Upashana briefly mentioned that she was chased by rhinos once and it was a funny situation. <laughs> and viewers in the comments were like what you can't just like tell us that and not tell us the story but we didn't have time because we were on the bottom looking at corals and you know we need to stay focused but now I think we have time so do you think you can share what happened <laughs> give us the story the context start from the very beginning <laughs> 
Okay, I will uh, try to keep it brief. And You're a little bit quiet, sorry. Uh, we want to hear this story. <laughs> <laughs> this story teller, unfortunately. So, it was in the month of January, seven years ago, and I was working in a national forest, uh, national park, we call them national parks in India. It was the Dudva National Park in North India. And January winter, quite cold, foggy. It doesn't snow there, but it was very cold and humid. And we were towards the end of our field season. Uh, so generally each day there would be one of us and we would be accompanied by a local forest guard. But that day, uh, most of the trails, because we were doing transex studies, so most of the trails were, we, were, we had already finished. And just to clarify, transex, you mean like lot, like basically lines where yes. you take data at multiple points yeah, along that line? exactly. So we, uh, so there were three of us, research, uh, in junior researchers and one forest guard. So four of us were together on a trail that day and um, it, it is, was a part of a forest where they were doing a rhino reintroduction program because rhinos were found in that national park, but they had died off several years ago and they were being moved from another part of India and reintroduced. So parts of the forest were uh, cordoned off so that uh, the tigers cannot enter that area and there were electric fencing. And it's a different story that they fell in the river twice got shocked by the uh, electric uh, fences already twice. We're got so shocked three times the same day. <laughs> We're so glad but you're still here with us. <laughs> it was two times into the story. And then we had reached a comparatively drier spot and we were walking through the forest and suddenly there is this huge rhino that's in front of us, like maybe, I, I don't know in terms of distance, like maybe 20 meters or so away and we can see it. And uh, the forest guard that was with us, he immediately ran and climbed up a tree. And the tree was huge. And uh, we are like, I cannot Oy. climb that tree. And it didn't <laughs> have like lots of branches. It was one of those very tall trees with less branches. So we are like hiding behind the trees. I'm waiting. sorry, you said the guide that was Yeah, the you? forest guide. Yeah, okay. he ran okay. and climbed up a tree. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't. The others were also confused. So we were like, we're going to hide behind these trees because they were huge trees. And then we realized that we were mistaken. The giant rhino was actually a baby rhino. Oh my gosh. Then the mother peeked out from the forest and saw oh us. No. So then we realized that how big our one horn <laughs> rhinos can be. And the mother was not at all happy to see us. She was obviously not happy. But the baby rhino was very excited and curious. Oh. It was like in its baby rhino ways was oh. gradually coming <laughs> towards us. And we were like, it is cute, but the mother is also following it. And she is not happy by our presence. And they were very close to us when the baby rhino suddenly decides that it's done. And it wants to go and explore the other side. So it turns and goes away. Now the mother rhino is very confused that should she come over to us and attack us and scare us off or go after the baby. So for a while she was just in the middle trying to decide looking at both directions and then decided to go after the baby. So thankfully for us <laughs> we got saved but the funniest part was after this incident we realized that us three adults, three adults in like in our early 20s we had chosen the thinnest possible tree in the forest to hide behind <laughs> and we had not realized that till the whole thing was over and there were much larger and thicker trees around us all three of us were hiding behind one single tree <laughs> that was probably the thinnest and the weakest tree in the forest <laughs> Oh, so that is one of the stories of getting chased by the rhino. Just one? Just one. There's in the same time, one. we got chased another time, but that's different. <laughs> what? Oh, that is wild. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Fun. <laughs> that's crazy. And I love how you're just sharing this, like, with a smile on your face, like you're not traumatized or oh, anything. No. You're I just mean, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's and then amazing. the forest guard after this had come down from the tree and was like, oh, you guys are fine. As if like he was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> like obviously you ran off. He was the first one to run away. <laughs> <laughs> yes. oh. oh my gosh. That's a great wow. story. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh oh my no, anytime I see like a baby animal, I'm mm. very cautious because I know yeah. there's probably like... 
a mama animal nearby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they'll, they'll, you don't want to mess with the no. moms. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's smart of you because I see cute baby animals. And, I mean, obviously, I won't go up to it, but yeah. in my head, I'm like, oh, it's so cute. <laughs> Not even thinking about the, the possible dangers <laughs> of that surround me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow, so the viewers can see the map. <laughs> yes, yeah, for sure. So, wow, I'm so excited because a lot of times our viewers are asking if they can see the map. So thank you so much for pulling that up. Um, so right now, if you take a look at, um, I guess it's channel one of our feed. Um, but if it's not, uh, check other channels. We Is have channel uh, two. <laughs> Three. It should be PC3. I don't know what oh, channel Oh, okay, that three. Is. So channel three then. Um, so if you're watching one of the other channels, um, basically on YouTube, there's multiple channels on different links. So just check our YouTube page um, and choose the channel three. And if you're on our web page, um, those channel buttons are on the bottom of the video. So um, our map is on channel three. And again, we're at Gambia Shoal. So um, this is a seamount with a summit depth of about 1,600 meters, and we're located roughly 25 nautical miles southeast of Midway Atoll. It was mapped previously by RV Falcor in 2014, but no previous dives have been conducted to explore um, this area. So uh, pretty exciting that we can get to uh, launch the ROVs here. And to create this map, um, we have to, you know, use pretty amazing technology like multi-beam sonar, and we have dedicated mappers on board that create a, a map before every dive. So that way we know where the ridges are, where best to put these ROVs down um, in order to see uh, the biology and the geology of the area. And we have our amazing uh, mapper that's part of our watch. Um, Mia, would you like to share more about uh, your process in creating this map and the terrain we're going to be yeah. looking at today. Thank you. So I didn't actually create this one. I was sleeping. Oh. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> Great. A, a lot of the past dives, I happened to be on watch while we were collecting the information. And then usually um, Rennie and, uh, and or Derek, but I think usually Rennie actually compiles everything together. Um, I believe Catalina was working, was awake when we were collecting this information. But basically, as we were preparing for this dive from the last dive site we did a transit here and as you mentioned it had already been mapped but we wanted to do another coverage over the area to see if our data would line up with the previous data and there is a bit of a difference so we're going to be cautious as we go in so if you see here there's a really strong ridge line but some areas uh, don't quite line up perfectly, so we can't we we can't use this blindly. We it's a reference, and we need to also just kind of uh, work with the ROV pilots and, and their sonars to make sure we don't just follow this. Like, you know, if you just listen to a GPS but don't pay attention to where you're going and then drive into a lake or something, that was a <laughs> that was like a, 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 a thing on the office. But um, <laughs> if you watch the Office TV show. But um, yeah, so we have to, we have it as a guide. And of course the resolution is not, you know, it's like a hundred meter resolution. So again, we will be going, hopefully going up along this ridge line. Um, and then we'll just be careful as we come up here because they're just a little offset compared to the other data sources that we had. And, uh, just wanted to show you this, show the viewers to give you an idea of what it looks like because this isn't something people often get to see. And yeah. as we're doing kind of a live dive site, as we're descending, you can see how that ridge looks and how we're going to be going up this little, it's rounded and then, you know, it's a little less steep and then there's a little, almost like a tiny mound, and then we go back down to like a saddle, and then we'll go back and end at the top of this area. Wow. Can so, you, uh, so can you rotate around to the other side? Yes. So that's what the, that's what all the stuff we don't see is gonna look like. Yeah. 
So what what happens if you like zoom in on waypoint one now? So the controls are very tricky. <laughs> so here's waypoint one. So this is what we're aiming to land on right now. On that little diamond. Right here. Yep. Right. Right there. So it's a little bit of a saddle, actually. Uh, well, we think it's a saddle. So uh, area that's a bit of a dip uh, between the two sides, and. So we'll start here, waypoint one, as we descend. And then this is actually, uh, even though it looks like it's going up and you might think north, the waypoints are actually going in a southerly direction. So then <coughs> the contour lines are 10 meter elevations. Is that our typical kind um, of default? So or can you, I you can change those? So on this view the contours are a hundred meters a hundred meters I think on this view on yeah. the high pack we have the 10 meters ah, that explains some things yeah that explains some things yes so a hundred meters is quite a lot so again we it's not perfect it's not a perfect rep representation if it was then uh, why would you know it wouldn't be as exciting to explore because we'd already know exactly what it looks like so uh, a little bit of an element of surprise makes it fun, but it also can be very stressful. So. Mm, and thank you so much for that rundown. Can you um, explain what you mean by contours? Because um, some of our viewers may not be as familiar with maps. For sure, yeah. So if you see these lines that yeah. are, yeah, so those are called contour lines. And normally, if you're looking at a, a topographic map, maybe if you're hiking or something, they normally will have numbers on them. And uh, there'll be a scale bar usually that's in the legend that says something like, the contour lines are 10 feet or 10 meters. And as you're looking at the, the map, um, there'll be incremental numbers to show you if it's getting steeper or uh, if so, if it's steeper or, or if you're rising in elevation or decreasing in elevation. So these don't have numbers on them. You can We can tell by the, the gradient of the uh, bathy data underneath of it from the colors. Um, so sometimes when it's like a very uniform color, I have a hard time knowing if we're going, you know, which, uh, if we're going to be going, if we're going to be descending or not. Like I this do is too. all just green, so it's, it's a surprise sometimes <laughs> because it doesn't have those numbers. Mm -hmm. But the way it works is that each one of these, because we know it's 100 meters, each one is a 100 meter step. So let's say this is 100, then this one, if we're increasing uh, or, or ascending, let's say this would be 200. Right. Uh, so over here, if it was 100, then this would be 200. This would be 300, this would be 400, this would be 500 meters. Um, and then the opposite could be, you know, 100 and, you know, going into descending. So it's really hard when you don't have those intervals. I like to have them on there. Uh, mm -hmm. But we also have this bathymetric, the color variance for us. So uh, sometimes if you hear us discussing in the front row, I think. I've discussed with Dan before, like, are we descending or are we ascending? Because it's really hard to tell with that, with the color gradient when it's all about the same color. Is that Does that right. make sense? Yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you so much. So the, the closer they are together, the steeper it is. Yes, that's, yes. Thanks, Hans. So yeah, the closer they are together, the steeper it is. So the more farther, the farther apart, it means it's going to take you longer. If you imagine it's going to take me a while to walk, this is 100 meters, right? It's going to take me a while to walk up this. And here, this one between waypoint one and two, you have, I don't know, like, let's call that an inch or something. So you're going up, oh, this is 100 meters. But when you go to the next one, you see it's, you know, about a third of the width. So that means it's going to be steeper compared to this one because there's a shorter distance between the contour lines. Therefore, it's going to take you a smaller amount it's a, a, le a small amount of time to cross that distance. Right. Wow. Yeah. So definitely some of these lines are closer together. That's steeper. And that um, lines farther apart are um, less steep. Right. Yeah. And there, awesome. are, and there is some, sorry, yep. there's mm -hmm. some way I forget the button, but in the bottom you can pull up um, the 
uh, elevation profile for that line that's on there. Oh. I don't know how to do that. You click the line somehow, and then in the bottom box you get a... a um, like a cross-section? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. We so have that in the dive plan. We do have it in the dive plan. I don't yeah. want to do that just because when I was touching this before the I came on watch, it adjusted the lines. But yeah. um, maybe for another dive, I can get that ready. Yeah. What's well, important to know because the the main climb we'll do in the, in the early deepest part of this dive will be from waypoint one to four or five, and as Taylor Ann mentioned, we'll be focusing a mo little more rock collection between waypoint one and five to get some really? deeper samples. Yeah, rather than stretching it out over the whole dive. That's per Val's suggestion. Because Thanks, of the Ann. rapid. Elevation yeah, change. Anytime. Yeah, because she's interested in, in more of the deeper samples rather than the ones from the saddles or from flatter areas. Yeah. Yeah, I think when uh, Val's been able to cut open and see that what's inside of these rocks, um, more yeah. of the samples that are more helpful and things that she's looking for have been uh, at the deeper points um, and more angular and more grapefruit sized. Um, so, yep. yeah, that's kind of Definitely our focus. Angular, wedge shaped, grapefruit size. These are all very technical terms. <laughs> and very uh, technical. We'll be looking for those rocks. And, and, and as was mentioned before, too, um, front row, yeah, the little discrepancy in the previous mapping and the images now. We'll be following the ridge, you know, and our default will be the ridge. And, and it won't be necessary for us to exactly hit all the waypoints on the way up as long as we're on the ridge. Yeah. Is that, that correct? Yeah, yeah that's about. generally yep. yeah. how we roll. Yeah, yeah. great. And, so, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I think, are we nearing the bottom? Yeah, we're getting Yeah, we're, we're getting closer. We're so getting closer. I'm going to jump back off SPL, but hopefully that made sense to everyone. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I definitely want to give kudos again to Catalina, uh, other mapper with me, and Rennie and Derek. They, even though I'm talking about this, I'm not the one that made this. So I want to make sure everyone gets their kudos for putting in the work. Um, yeah, it's very helpful. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, man. Thanks. For the, it's very helpful for us as operators to see this in 3D. Like, it, uh, uh, it's, yeah, I don't know why. It, cli <laughs> it clicks for me. I look at the dive plan in a picture, but when you rotate it around and it's presented in that fashion, my, my little reptile. Also break and process it. So thank you. Yeah, it's also just beautiful. I don't know. It's like it a, is. a piece of art. It looks amazing. It is beautiful. Yeah. It's very it beautiful. Is. All right. I was speaking from above my monitor before when you had it up just on your screen. <laughs> so now if I could only have the ROV tracking on that map real time. Yeah. It's on my <laughs> wish list. Wouldn't that be sweet? If you had a oh, little Hercules icon yeah. moving up <laughs> along the ridge. Yeah. That would be Why amazing. Not? Yeah, I mean, you can ha I mean, I'm sure... If any grown-ups are listening... <laughs> that technology exists. Christmas is coming? What if was that? not, yeah. we should There's some coders out there who could do it. that. Yeah, I know... Uh, we used a program before. It might have been a, a type of sonar. What was it? Norbit or something? Um, Correct. Like, yeah, that, yeah that was really cool. Um, I think Chris, wow. one of our... Um, navs and data um, engineers. Nav, uh, data, alpha geek. Yeah, alpha <laughs> geek for sure. <laughs> very, very intelligent. Um, created a really amazing program that we've used on Herc before um, that great. had a, a view similar to that. That's great, yeah. And also for us in the back row uh, who are not very well versed in these technicalities, it helps us looking at this 3D model to also understand where we are and how we are going to progress through the dive. That's really helpful. Yeah, and since um, the geography, I'm sure, it also impacts like what biology we're going to find. It definitely absolutely. helps to have a better idea of um, what this landscape looks like. Yeah. Well, we'll find out. This will be the first dive on this seamount. So we'll see it for the first time. Yes, that's so exciting. And I'm excited for us to start seeing the bottom and the biota. And I hope we see some wonderful and as yeah. we know okay. there is a non-zero <laughs> <Absolutely. percent laughs> chance Absolutely of fine. seeing some sort of interesting anthropogenic debris <laughs> we are five minutes from touchdown five minutes about roughly 
Uh, Thanks, Jake. Thank uh, you for the update. Five minutes to the bottom. Yeah, that's why we keep you around, Hans. <laughs> Hope dies <laughs> <guys> last. <laughs> I'm not talking about a bit of net. <laughs> yeah, no, we don't want to see that kind of anthropogenic no. impact. No. Yeah. My mother used to draw these maps by hand. Wow, really? Wow. Yeah, that's from amazing. University of Chicago. Oh, oh that is hey, amazing. You know, I, I have a thing for maps. I don't know why. Like, since a kid, <laughs> I've loved the maps, and I've seen those hand-drawn maps, and I've always thought that how can people actually do them. It's yeah. so wonderful. Do you, do you, can you share a little bit more about what that process yeah. was like, if you were able to like, see her work or anything? Well, you know, uh, this geographer, you, you get the field data in and you plot the contour lines and you use shading and interpretation for the features, natural and cultural features, and, and draw them. Uh, I told her I was very proud of her for doing that. Yeah. And she worked in the Pentagon for a number of years. She graduated in 1946, so I think it was late 40s, early 50s. Mm -hmm. When she was in the Pentagon, they lived near Washington, D.C. And it was an exciting time in my parents' lives. I like to hear those stories from her. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh. Crazy to think everything that we're doing with computers at one point had to we be had done to be by hand. Right. Yeah, it it gives crazy. really a lot of perspective and a lot of respect for the scientists and researchers who were working back then. Yeah. yeah. Making graphs by hand instead of photographs of samples. We yeah. have to draw all Illustrating. Them. And she was, yeah. a, she was a you know, a, uh, a, a woman, a Chinese woman from Hawaii who got a job in cartography in the Pentagon in the wow. late that yeah, that's awesome. early 1950s. Not a common thing at that yeah. time, I guess. Not a common thing, and I, I told her, I thought that was, you know, and she just kind of, oh no, I, you know, no big deal. So I humble. Her, that was <laughs> <really> <laughs> <cool>. <laughs> I think it's very humble. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I like her as Asians. Um, yeah. Sure. She just have it instilled in us. Which is not always great, and I realize that as growing up, that, oh, whatever we are doing, that's not a big deal. <laughs> Just like it. getting yeah. chased by rhinos. Yeah. So you're starting <laughs> to get uh, Doppler beams there? But yeah. So that means you have altitude. In the 1950s, 1940s, that's a big, that is a very big thing. That is a very big thing. Yeah. Um, just checking in with the pilots, um, yep. if they're on SPL, if we should pause on comms. We have altitude. We'll stand by and it's about to get real. All right. <laughs> we'll pipe All right. down a bit and I'll we'll talk about the origin of that term, pipe down later. It's our maritime Ooh, yeah. term. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to slow down a little so, yeah, you can go manual now and you can um, hit. Uh, you can click in auto heading and I'm going to do the same here. And. Uh, we should zero your tether wraps. Uh, that's going to be to the right of the little blue box there, where it says zero tether wraps. Uh, here, I can do it from here. No, no, not not turn. So that's a right now it says one, but it hopefully it's not one. But as it walked around on the way down, it may have. Um, well, so there's a few bugs here uh, in the software. Um, one of them is we call the double tap bug. So when you first hit auto depth or auto altitude, the thrusters come on full the opposite way, which is uh, really fun. So when you first hit auto altitude, yeah, auto head. Uh, when you first select one of those buttons, the thrusters come on full the opposite way. So, for example, if you hit auto altitude, it um, tries to... No, <laughs> no, I'm explaining the bug. So when you first engage it, it drives the thrusters full speed, and it will slam you into the seabed. So you got to do the double tap on it. So usually, um, at this point, we bring up the auto XY page. Yeah. And to the right, one more left, left. Yeah, no, left, one more left, that one. So you see on there that has, you can tell what you have engaged right now, you have auto heading on. And uh, we want that 
we want to start increasing our delta now, so I've slowed down on the winch to 10 meters a minute. And we want to get that, yeah, 20 meter delta now. Uh, you can go for 100%. Full beans, as Aquaman says. So I'm going to slow down a little bit more here. So the one, uh, the one that really pops for me is we now have four Doppler beams. So that means the uh, Doppler velocity log on Hercules is is picking up the seabed, and uh, I'm going to probably stop here a little. Uh, we already know that um, from looking at uh, Mia's map that we're going to go to the south to start. So in theory, south is going to be uphill. <coughs> so when we get a little closer, we're going to want to position Hercules to the south of Atalanta. That way we don't come down. But in the meanwhile, we'll just be below Atalanta. Uh, yeah, but it's hard to do while we're coming down like this, so we'll get a little bit closer. The other thing you'll start seeing, you can see on uh, Atlanta sonar, you start seeing some blue there in the outer rings. So Atlanta sonar is actually picking up the seabed now. And if this was a, a really steep wall or something, you can pick up some, yeah, some red. Uh, danger, danger. So in that case, we would want to uh, get Hercules over as the kind of the curb feeler because you know Hercules can run away. Roger. It's Atalanta we want, so we'll we'll move Hercules around here in a minute. Um Sometimes Atalanta sonar can fool you. You can see those kind of uh, those four square lines. So there's a a strange reflection with the sonar that kind of it's echoing off the frame a little. So that might not be you know we're probably not coming down into a perfectly square box. So, um, but. Because it is picking up some backscatter, it's kind of echoing off the frame a little there. But they're getting closer as we come down, so trust your instruments, but verify. Trust but verify is one of our sayings here. Trust but verify. So you can uh, full stick down still. Yeah, you're 80 meters off the seabed, and, and so is Atalanta. So, Atlantis sonar is, uh, I'm sorry, Atlantis altimeter is not as uh, reliable as Hercules, because Hercules is using a Doppler velocity log, which has four beams that come out at an angle, it takes an average. Atlantis is using a traditional altimeter, which is a single beam, a 10 degree width. And as Atlanta, uh, yeah, Atlanta tends to porpoise a little bit as the ship heaves. So in calmer weather, it's a bit more accurate. In in rougher weather, it'll it'll be erratic because Atlanta's, and you can see that from the pitch, pitch and roll on Atlanta. Mostly the pitch. It nose dives when it gets, you know, it comes up, gets light, and the front of it's heavier, and it nose dives down, which you've probably seen uh, from your from your camera. Yeah, so that 20 meter delta is a good delta now, and that'll get you also a little closer to Atalanta. Obviously, you know, it's the same like string here. Yeah, exactly. So we come down the last hundred meters a bit slower because, you know, as Mia, as Mia suggested, the the. The USBO accuracy is, you know, 1% of water depth, so there's some error there. You can work out the math, you know, it's not too hard, 25 meters at 
at tw uh, 2,500 meters, uh, plus or minus, right? So, and then the, um, yeah, the bathymetry map, you know, also relies on GPS and acoustics. And so everything can be shifted a little. It's not too uncommon to have a 20 meter or so shift one way or the other. 50 meters altitude in the 50s now. So I don't know if, have we come down on this watch yet and acquired the seabed? I don't. I think one. Uh, on the ship, yeah. Oh, on the yeah. Ship so race, it's yeah. going to be a little different here. Um, the archaeology dies. Yeah. This is so different. So be, be patient with us. Uh, no problem. So as we come down, um, the first thing we're going to do is kind of, you know, same thing you do when you drive into a new neighborhood or walk around in a new park. You look around a little bit. And so we're going to use the, uh, the input sensors that we have, our sonars, our cameras, altimeters, et cetera. Uh, the other thing we're going to do is record some numbers, uh, parameters of the system, which would be our compensation levels, you know, pressures, temperatures, humidity, et cetera, et cetera, just kind of a health check of the system. Uh, Mia will be over there. She's got um, like a 200-page checklist for things that... <laughs> right. Yep, no problem. We're standing by. And yeah, so that data is collected by several instruments on both the ROV, uh, both the, both of the ROVs, in addition to um, uh, you know some other data they have. Um, uh, video will also be busy, so we'll get the manipulator out and we'll stick that in front of the camera, and um, we'll do the weight balance thing. And uh, that ground fault is from the, because we turned the craft on. So anything below one meg ohm is, uh, it just, it's a, what you call a indicator light, like on your car when you have the low oil or engine light. Yeah, it's like an engine light. I was going to call it something else, but that's not, yeah. Um, and just want to jump in real quick and thank you for sharing that explanation of what's going on. It's really great to learn, you know, all of these steps and if anyone in the front row doesn't mind also turning on SPL we actually have some commenters saying they would like to uh, join yeah. and learn as well so they want to hear like what questions Jacob is asking as he learns to drive Herc more and Mia what you're up to so feel free Co to tune uh, join. That. Turn, uh, turn SPL on. But again no pressure if you have other conversations going yeah. on with the bridge or anything as right. well. You don't have to listen they just want to hear you talking so they don't have to listen to me drone on one-sided conversation oh yeah sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mentioned earlier i had spl off uh when dan said there's stuff i have to do after 15 minutes at the bottom i will apply a new sound speed profile that has been collected as we've descended down to the bottom and that affects the accuracy of a number of things which I don't want to go into <laughs> details. I'm trying to 30 concentrate. Meters, 30, sure. 30 meters. Sure. Right but thank you for that little mini explanation. Yeah, mini explanation. Yeah, you guys can jump in just um, if we keep the information short so we can continue to process here. If we get distracted too long, uh, yep. we'll wind yeah. with Hercules in the mud. Sounds good, thanks. Uh, uh, so I tend to have sometimes clipped information because I'm multitasking. Um, let's get a little bit more delta there. Try and hold a 20 meter delta. Roger. So you can see now the yellow creeping in on the sonar. So yep. we, those, those are definite. That's real. That's the real deal there. So I'm going to come all stop on the winch at 35 meters of altitude, give or take. 35 to 40, it's bouncing around a bit. You want me to stop too? And yeah, so uh, what do you got? You got 20 meter delta, you're 24 meters altitude. Yep. So Atlantis current heading 
is 225. If uh, if you back up a little bit closer to Atlanta and maintain that depth or that altitude, either one, mostly watching the delta numbers at this point. So you're gonna, and uh, you do have auto heading clicked in, correct? Yeah, I do have auto heading on. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you come a little closer to Atlanta and give us a little uh, tether between the two, we could still see from your aft camera there that it's tight. Yeah. And you so want Delta to go up or down? Uh, I want to hold that 20 meter Delta right roughly. Here. If you want, you can uh, double tap auto depth and that will help you out. So when you press it the first time, you'll see the thrusters go to full deflection on your little blue box. Mm -hmm. The second time you pressed it, so in theory, it should hold its depth now. It should hold that 20 meter delta. Again, I'm all stopped on the wind. So if you back up a little now towards uh, Atlanta. Backing up. And that'll give us a little uh, slack in the tether. And then I'm gonna bring Atlanta's heading around to the south, which should um, line us up with the uphill, which is the direction we wanna go. So Atlanta's coming around to the south. It should, in theory, see um, uphill in front of us and behind us because we are indeed in the saddle. So Mia, Mia nailed it on the vessel position, which is always nice. All right, looks like I should be so backing up. Yeah, so where you're going to want to be now, you're going to want to position Hercules to the south of Atlanta. Roger. So if you hold that delta, you can uh, turn and burn, give her full beans. I can rotate south. Yeah, yeah roger. Rotating south. If you have enough leash, yeah. I think I do. Um, if you're, so take it out of auto heading, you'll take get more authority there. Yeah, and then give her a twist to the right. You can come around something, I don't know, 225-ish or so. 225. Oh, no, I think, um, I don't think I have yeah, enough. South-southwest. I think I'm pulling on you. Yeah, so okay. you'll have to uh, fly forward now and lateral right. Basically, <coughs> sorry, I shouldn't have to tell you how to fly. I should just tell you where to go. Um, you want to be closer to Atlanta. So whatever you got to do to to get there. I can, uh, I'll help you out here. I'm going to come down just a little, decrease the delta, that'll give you enough tether to turn Hercules around. Yes, please. So you'll have to, you'll have to keep commanding the, uh, the turn in. It's when you get stuck tail to tail, it's hard to get away. So you could be, you know, flapping out there in the breeze. Mm -hmm. It's likely the current is, um, as we've descended, it's swung Hercules down, down current. So the technique maybe is, uh, if you're tail to tail, which you are, I can see in the camera there. Yeah. You were stuck, you're reverse. in a tight spot. Reverse yeah. back. Yeah, so full, full reverse. And you'll see the tether go slack there a little, or you can watch your nav screen and yeah. uh, see it get a little closer. You don't need a lot, you need like uh, two vehicle lengths. And then uh, once you get some slack, then you can turn hard to starboard. Roger. Yeah, now turn hard to starboard. Yeah. Full stick. Yeah, so click in auto head there. Now uh, back up and, or lateral right, you can try lateral right a little, might get you some. The other thing I can do is I can turn Atlanta back to the west. That'll give you a little more uh, slack as well. Should give you enough to get around. There you go. So also watch your um, your thruster commands there. So if you're have auto heading on and 
um, it can't do it. It'll just have one thruster going mm -hmm. and not the other one. Challenging to get around. Let me see for a second. I'll see if I can. Yeah. I feel like this whole time it has been kind of pushed over here. You'll give me some and then we'll like rubber band it back. Kind of. Yeah, I've been stuck here before. This is why I'm uh, a little anxious when we're stopped to look at something or doing a. Um, a sample. If we get too far away from Atlanta, we get stuck tail to tail. It can take a painfully long time to get back around, especially when there's current. Mm -hmm. I've operated other two body systems where we've been stuck that way for like six hours. Oh my oh, god! The current is just ripping. <laughs> yeah, there's just nothing we can do. The ROV is like water skiing behind oh. the. Here we have the luxury of uh, being able to move the vessel if With we have to, so. yeah, or come down on Atlanta or up. But if you're, you know, depending on what kind of job you're doing, sometimes you can't do that. Uh, there we go. I see a turning. There we go. There we go. There we go. So this is a bit dodgy here because uh, we're. I cheated there and came up on the delta. But you need to cheat because the current, yeah, it's going to bring you back. Yeah, so if you see the way the tether is out of Hercules aft camera now, it's coming right over the top of the vehicle, which, you know, we have a risk of entanglement, so. And Adelant has been pulled a bit to the side, but you're, I think you're still in that saddle area. Yeah, I think so, too. 40 meters from the closest thing. Wrong button, Dan. The USBL is also, you know, not not instant. The heading change is fairly quick, but um, the position, you know, takes several seconds to. Yeah. I totally forgot that the only time we we've descended to the bottom was during the Akagi dive. Is it really? I think so. I thought we did a try to do a white balance once and uh, curse black box over there giving Jane a grief. That thing's got more buttons on it than the whole ROV system. <laughs> that did indeed happen. The fix to that was just unplugging it and yeah, plugging it back in. Go ahead, yeah. Just push it this way. There you go. I see the seabed. I see the line. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring your you head keep to the auto depth here to do south off, here. Or do you uh, want to land and do? No, uh, stand by. No, we don't want to land yet. Uh, one thing to be aware of here is uh, we're gonna be in auto XY here, so oh. don't let 
uh, now awesome. reset yeah. your DBL. Bottom in sight. Okay. I have that. I have that in giant black letters. So this is um, one of the uh, a few times where we're going to use. So I'm going to click in uh, auto heading auto X Y, and then I'm going to when I first click this, you see it full thruster down. Yeah, that's why so you I click, click it in. off and click it again. Then they start to. Um, kind of. So it's struggling now. So there is indeed some you know, pretty good breeze because the the lateral is, lateral is like a hundred percent. Keep it in the same place. Yeah. So uh, we should be able to work out. It's trying to lateral right. Is that correct? Yeah. So you bring yeah. the winch down for the yeah. delta a little and bit, so it's not. Like 100 or something? And we got blown to the east really hard, right? So see how the vehicle's bouncing all around right now? It can't it can't do it. So it's, you know, you're like a semi-truck going down the freeway with the w side wind. So I'm going to click off the auto heading there, and I'm going to turn the vehicle. Uh, to where we want it and click it again. To starboard into the wind. Yeah, see, it's not even holding its position. It's it's uh, sailing away. Part of that is I need to come down here a little bit. So we'll click auto head there and with our. So you should be able to let go of it now, and it should. Um, yeah, stay in the same way. In theory. For the most part. Awesome. Yeah, you can see from the particles moving. So you're you're stationary, right, at yep. the moment. You can see from the particles going through the water that um, it's ripping. Uh, so I'm going to try and turn Atlanta sideways now, and we're going to see where are you? Where are you? I should be able to see you. Have we officially touched bottom? No. Negative, but or. Roger. Or, you know, five, eight meters off the bottom, somewhere there. Yeah, usually um, I mark on bottom for sight of you can. Uh, the bottom. Yeah. yeah, I have to mark it as two. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah, no problem. Also, I hear myself in an echo. That's really weird. Does anyone else hear that? No, just okay. you. come down on uh, some benign ter terrain but yeah I it's it's uh, it's gonna be a little spicy so you can see the current pushing the tether out yep. behind there I'm probably gonna trade you now because it's gonna All be right. Don't worry. Uh, tough you. with the um, but you can uh, I'll let you get the manipulator out and do the weight balance thing. So we'll we'll trade and then. For viewers at home, Jake was piloting Hercules and Dan was helping him, and they're now swapping back. So Dan is now back with Hercules, and Jake's going to be with Atalanta. Thanks, Mia, and for everyone who's had a few questions about um, what's happening with the. Hercules driving, we can get to those in a second once um, our ROV pilots are in a, in a good position. We're, uh, yeah, we have, um, a really stiff, um, we appear to have a pretty good breeze here, and, uh, yeah, that's full ahead. <laughs> Sure, I believe that yet. Yeah, that's that's pretty much full head there. Well, that's gonna be interesting. Um, 
Yeah, so if you uh, you can bring your head back to uh, where am I? I should be yeah to your starboard. You can look one eight zero. And just a note again, if anyone in the front row wants to join SPL so the viewers can hear um, all the questions, that would be great. But no pressure if you have Roger, other conversations. Bad. You want to get the... Um, yep. the we're going to go through some yes. checks here and uh, our weight balance and uh, sound velocity profile and all that stuff. So we'll be busy for a few minutes here. You want to get the uh, manipulator out? I can. Let me retract the camera. We're going to look at the craft manipulator here. Craft power? I have comms. Yeah, you have comms. It might be a little jumpy the first time there. And uh, what you're going to do is put it straight out and then kind of move to the left. Roger. Uh, is this considered bottom? Are you still hovering? Yeah, we're on bottom. Yeah. All right, Roger. Yeah, log it usually when we get uh, visibility of the seabed. Visual on seabed is the, uh, okay, come down on the shoulder a bit. You're going to put the, uh, if you look down in your bubble, you see yep. where the jaws are. So you're going to have to be out to the right a bit. Uh, yeah, and then come down. If you hit the porch, you're too close. Okay, if you halt, halt it there. I'm going to, uh, you're halted? Yep. Okay, so we're kind of close to the camera there, so try not to move for a minute. And uh, part of the reason we uh, get vis vis I can talk visual on Atlanta and the uh, down-looking camera here is because uh, Jane is going to make the camera go black now as she does the white balance. Work your magic. Am I going to start? Yeah, you're clear to start. And while she's doing that, you can be uh, real careful with that thing because it's live. <laughs> if you touch that button, it yeah, goes. Yeah, 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 hold, yeah. Do you think you can move me a little bit to the left to fill the screen to the left? a little I more? Can do it. Yeah. Okay. Thank How's you. That? Yeah, that's good enough. Well, what Jane is doing now is uh, a weight balance with the Zeus camera, so oh. she's uh, color correcting the sensor so those greens are greens the reds are reds and blues are blue and jacob is recording about uh, 100 parameters in our dive log here all of our compensation levels ground fault readings uh, temperature readings of the motor the